Hi, everyone. And in this video, uh, I'm going to be introducing you to uh, infections of the skin and the eye. Um, so uh, the first thing we should start by talking about is uh, sort of what are the layers of the skin, what's going on with the anatomy of the skin and the eye, uh, so we can get an understanding of sort of what those infections might look like, the tissues that are being impacted, and get a better understanding of what the body can also help to do to sort of prevent or fight off these infections. So uh, we talk about the layers of the skin, three major layers, epidermis, dermis, and hypodermis. Um, the epidermis is the outermost layer. Uh, this consists mainly of dead cells uh, that provide a barrier, and that's going to protect the cells beneath it. Um, what happens over time is we gradually shed these these skin cells. Uh, this is a process known as desquamation. Uh, this is protective, right? Because if there are bacteria, good, bad, or otherwise living on those skin cells as they slough off of us, um, they're removed from the body and then replaced by hopefully new bacteria that colonizes um, that particular tissue. Uh, the dermis is below. This is where we're going to find our blood vessels, nerves, um, hair follicles, muscles, all that good stuff. Um, the sweat glands and the sebaceous glands uh, that we find there are also protective. They're part of our first line of defense uh, by creating a barrier, um, by secreting antimicrobial agents and things like that. Uh, so that plus the desquamation both contribute to that first line of defense, helping provide a barrier for things making it into our body. Uh, when we look at the microbiota of our skin, you can see that our skin is probably one of our most colonized organs. Um, you can see that there are a lot of different places uh, on our skin um, that are colonized by, by various species of bacteria. And the thing that we need to remember about these uh, these species is, uh, in general, these are considered healthy. We want them to be here. Um, they're going to be antagonistic towards other things that we're going to learn about today that we don't want to be on our skin. Uh, but we also do have to recognize that some of these can be opportunistic pathogens. These are things that could potentially cause issues if they were to make it into a different part of the body and they're meant to be in, right? So for example, something that's on our skin is fine, but if it gets into the eye, that could be problematic or something when it's on the skin is fine, but if it gets into a wound uh, that through our skin uh, and into the body, then it could become a problem. So we just want to keep that in mind as well. So we're going to start by talking about bacterial infections of the skin. So all of these are infections caused by bacterial species. Um, one of the most common species that we find uh, groups of species, I should say, that we find on our skin are the Staphylococcus species. Um, most common sort of healthy bacteria that we're going to find there, Staphylococcus epidermidis is one, Staphylococcus hominis is another. Um, but one that we really need to be careful about is Staphylococcus aureus. Uh, if you look at this image over here, this plate that you're seeing, this is an MSA plate that has uh, two different species of Staph on it. Staph aureus is over here on the left. Uh, you can see the yellow coloration. That's indicative of something that can ferment that mannitol in there. Uh, and that that is a good indicator that you're dealing with Staph aureus. On the other side, you see... Um, I believe that Staphylococcus epidermidis on the right, that's a, a healthy non-pathogenic, I shouldn't say non-pathogenic, but um, a healthy part of our normal microbiota over there does not turn the MSA plate yellow. Um, I, be careful here. I don't want to correlate the change in color with pathogenicity. It's just that is one of the ways that we use to identify Staphylococcus aureus. So like I said, Staph aureus is very common on the skin and in the nasal passages. Um, there are people who can carry this particular bacterium asymptomatically. Um, that means they're not being affected by it, but, um, you know, we do need to be careful that, you know, you probably won't know that you're an asymptomatic carrier of this. And if you were to transfer it to a patient or something like that, that could be highly problematic. Uh, and that's because it's spread very easily through skin to skin contact. So, you know, it's, you, you know, you, it's in your nose, you wipe your nose, um, uh, you know, on the back of your hand or your sleeve or something like that, that touches a patient who's immune compromised or, or, or whatever. And that can be problematic. Um, the, the two strains of these, I shouldn't say strains, but two types of Staphylococcus aureus that we're really concerned about are, are MRSA and VERSA. So uh, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus and vancomycin-resistant uh, Staphylococcus aureus. Um, these are real concerns because they are resistant to lots of different antibiotics um, and, you know, methicillin 
uh, Vanco. These are two drugs that we use very commonly to treat staph infections. So if the strain that we're dealing with is resistant to one or both of these drugs, that's really problematic because now we're, our, our treatment options are severely limited. Um, Certain strains of these produce uh, some important virulence factors, uh, uh, hemolysins, coagulase, leukocytins. Uh, these are problematic because they can damage blood cells. They can prevent blood clotting. They can actually, like leukocytins, target white blood cells. So in other words, what's happening here is they produce um, virulent exotoxins, essentially, that disrupt our immune processes. They damage, they, they fight back against the immune system as it's trying to attack them. Uh, the way we often see staphylococcal, staphylococcal skin infections manifest uh, is in the form of pyoderma. So these are pus-producing infections. Uh, they go by different names. So uh, folliculitis, you're going to see sort of reddening of the skin. Uh, and it's going to be clear there's an infection there. But then it can progress as it goes deeper into the tissue. And you end up with things called furuncles, which are also commonly called boils or carbuncles, which are more severe. You can see those in the two images I, hear, I have here on the right. Uh, uh, carbuncles are much deeper, um, and the problem is by the time it makes it that far into the tissue, we're now dealing with potentially systemic uh, issues because we're now starting to, to get down into that layer where the blood vessels are, and now we're, now the bacteria the bacteria is, are getting access to the to the bloodstream, um, and that's where it can be really really dangerous. And you're starting to look towards things like sepsis and endocarditis, which are other downstream consequences of staphylococcal skin infections, uh, if not treated properly. So when you have something like this, you've got to drain that. Um, you got to use antibiotics to to, to fix this issue. Uh, another issue we see very commonly in infants and young children, it's called scalded skin syndrome. So this is a superficial Staphylococcus aureus infection. You can see uh, on this poor child here, you can see the skin's literally peeling off. Uh, this is often what, if you've ever seen a, what, what a scalding injury looks like when somebody gets like boiling water or hot liquid on them, that's what's going to happen. That outer layer of skin is just going to peel off because it's burned. Uh, this is not a burn, uh, but it has that appearance, which is why it's called scalded skin syndrome. This is actually the result of uh, an infection with Staphylococcus aureus um, and usually simple, simply resolves itself with treatment with antibiotics. All right, so uh, let's move on to uh, another type of infection caused by Staphylococcus aureus, uh, which can also be caused by Streptococcus pyogenes. So this is impetigo. So impetigo is characterized, uh, the most common manifestation of this is going to be uh, these honey-colored encrusted sores. They're often found um, on the face, but they can be on other parts of the body. Um, so Impetigo can be caused by either Staphylococcus aureus, which is a gram-positive Staphylococcus, or Streptococcus pyogenes, which is a gram-positive Streptococcus. Um, one of the things that we need to do during sort of identifying uh, how we're treating this is figuring out what the most likely causative agent is. So we're, we're going to have to do some sort of testing to figure out what it is um, if we're that worried about it. Um but usually we can treat this fairly simply regardless of which species is causing it through topical antibiotics. So like I said, signs and symptoms, vesicles, pustules, bullae around the nose and the mouth. That's the most common place you're going to find it. Those are going to rupture and they're going to find these yellowish honey encrusted sores. Uh, the problem with impetigo is it's incredibly contagious. Uh, so obviously this is impacting the skin. Skin cells slough off. If those skin cells slough off, they're going to have either the, 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 the staph aureus or the strep pyogenes on them. And if somebody touches that the, you know, you get those skin cells on you, which you may not even know, right? So this could be contact with a fomite contact with an individual. Um, if it gets on your body, then you could potentially, um, also end up with impetigo. Uh, usually we're not going to do any sort of testing. You can do bacterial cultures, like I mentioned before, to determine the exact causative agent, whether it's staph aureus or strep pyogenes. Um, but usually we don't need to do that because the same antibiotics are the same antibiotics are probably going to work for either. And it's usually topical, right? You just apply this cream right to the area uh, and it will go away. Clinical appearance is usually sufficient. There's not a lot of things that look like this. Um, so that's how we're going to diagnose this. Some complications, uh, we usually only see complications when it's arising, when this disease arises as the result of a, staph, uh, a streptococcal infection. So if it's streptococcus uh, pyogenes, um, there is a potential for some of those sequelae associated with 
Uh, Streptopagenes glomerulonephritis, which is uh, an inflammation of the kidney, uh, can be common. Um, we don't see too many complications with Staph aureus-based impetigo. Um, the next... The next infection that we'll talk about is uh, cellulitis. Cellulitis is typically caused by Streptococcus pyogenes, who we just met in the previous disease. Um, this is going to be a gram-positive Streptococcus. When you look at cellulitis, what you're going to see is that reddened skin. It's usually going to be warm to the touch. Notice that there's not really a rash here um, in per se. Like the, what I mean by that is there's no, it's red, right? It's red, it's warm, but you're not seeing like raised bumps. There's no pustules or anything like that. What what usually happens here is you've acquired Streptococcus pyogenes on your skin um, and you also have an open wound. And what's happened now is the Streptococcus has entered uh, through that open wound. It is now beginning to infect um, those uppermost layers of your skin. Um Usually diagnosis is going to be done through some type of agglutination test. ELISAs are often used. Um, and simple treatment with antibiotics is enough to get rid of this. Uh, complications, none really. Uh, the big issue is this can progress into other deeper tissue infections um, in some cases, uh, but really no complications. Once you get this diagnosed and, and treated with antibiotics, you're, you're probably going to be in good shape. Another skin infection caused by Streptococcus pyogenes, as well as some other species, is uh, erysipelas. So erysipelas, you notice that, that there are some similarities to what's going on with cellulitis. But the thing that you're seeing here is these patches are intensely inflamed. This is a much more pronounced infection. It's very obvious. Um, it's commonly going to be found on the face or the legs, whereas cellulitis can really be anywhere. We usually only see erysipelas on the face or the legs. Um, again, same type of transmission, right? You get streptococcus pyogenes on you. Um, it enters through an open wound and you get these types of infections. Again, diagnosis is the same, agglutination tests and ELISAs, antibiotics, um, and really no, none in terms of complications, typically none. So cellulitis, erysipelas, they are different diseases. They're different infections, but caused by the same species. It really depends on the, you know, more on exactly how this is presenting uh, and how we diagnose it. All right, now let's talk about something real nasty. Uh, so this is necrotizing fasciitis, more commonly known as flesh-eating bacteria. So um, the one thing we need to understand about this is this is not the result of a single species. There are lots and lots of species that can cause necrotizing fasciitis. What I've listed here as causative agents are the five most common that we find. Um, Streptococcus pyogenes, Staphylococcus aureus. I hope you're sensing a theme here, by the way. Streptococcus pyogenes and Staphylococcus aureus are very prominent bad actors uh, when it comes to skin infections. But we also have some other species. Vibrio vulnificus is one. Uh, Clostridium perfringens uh, is another, and uh, Escherichia coli can cause these. Um, so descriptions of these agents, Streptococcus pyogenes, we've met before, gram-positive Streptococcus. Just a reminder, all Streptococci are gram-positive. Same thing with Staphylococcus, so Staph aureus is a gram-positive Staphylococcus. Vibrio vulnificus, on the other hand, is a gram-negative Vibrio, so sort of that bent rod-shaped bacterium. Uh, Clostridium perfringens, it, perfringens is a gram-positive rod. Um, and E. coli is a gram negative rod. So, uh, we can see sort of some, finally, we're seeing some, some species with some different, uh, different shapes and gram reactions than we have in the first few slides. Um, signs and symptoms early on, you'll notice body aches, fever, chills, nausea, diarrhea. Uh, the thing that's really going to draw your attention to this being something. So like those signs and symptoms aren't crazy. There's so many things that cause that, but the severe pain at the site of the injury or the infection is going to be something that's going to start to help differentiate this. It's going to be something more like, okay, this isn't just like the flu or something like that. As the infection progresses, you're going to start to notice reddened, discolored skin. Uh, there's going to be swelling in the area. Um, you'll notice that there's going to be poor blood flow to the area. And finally, you're going to start to develop yellow uh, like yellow colored fluid filled blisters. Um, and then you're going to start seeing the necrosis, which is the tissue death. And as this begins to spread throughout the body, you're going to start to see signs and uh, symptoms of septic shock. Blood pressure is going to go into the tank as you get widespread um, 
widespread vasodilation um, and the blood pressure is going to drop as a result. You're going to start heading into sepsis because this is going to start progressing deeper, deeper into the tissues until it gets access to the bloodstream. And at this point, it becomes extraordinarily dangerous to the person who's suffering from this. Transmission again is this, these bacteria have to make it through the skin, right? Um, now, when it comes to diagnosing these, we need to do blood tests. We're probably going to need to do uh, some 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 tissue biopsies and do some cultures of bacteria from those deep tissues. We're also going to have to do some CT scans um, to treat this. Antibiotics, right? We need to use antibiotics. We need to have something that's going to fight back and kill these bacteria. It's going to be important to figure out exactly which species is causing the necrotizing fasciitis because the way we treat E. coli, for example, is going to be different than the way that we treat a staphylococcal-based form of this. Um, and if there's dead tissue, as you can see with the two patients that I'm showing here, I apologize for the graphic nature, particularly of that bottom image, but I mean, this is what you're going to see. We need to remove that tissue. The tissue's dead. It's rotting. It's got to be gone. So in terms of complications, um, there's probably going to be scarring. You can't lose that much tissue and not have permanent scarring as a result. You might also notice loss of limbs and digits. So if this impacts, um, you know, like if you're looking at huge amount of tissue loss to, to a leg or an arm. It may have to go a foot. People lose digits. Um, as the disease progresses, toxic shock syndrome becomes a very real possibility. Sepsis and death are also on the table. So uh, this is a very life-threatening infection that needs prompt intervention uh, and treatment if the patient's going to survive and have any type of positive outcome. Another very common skin bacterium uh, that we find on people is Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Uh, this is a gram-negative rod um, that can cause uh, several different types of infections. So uh, one very common one is called folliculitis, also known as hot tub rash. Uh, you're going to get sort of an itchy red skin rash as a result of this. They call it hot tub rash because pseudomonas can be spread very easily that way, and then it gets on your skin, and then you end up with this infection a little bit later. Uh, you may have also heard of swimmer's ear. The proper name for that is otitis ex Sterna, uh, in, uh, itching, redness, pain, and fever can be caused by this. Uh, one thing you're going to notice, uh, Pseudomonas is kind of a, a weird little bacterium. Uh, you notice in this, the image on the top right, the green coloration in between this person's toes. Uh, Pseudomonas tends to grow green. Um, when you grow it on plates in a laboratory, you'll notice that green color. Other interesting things, the infections often smell like grapes or fresh tortillas, depending on who you are. Uh, so uh, that's, uh, you know, you see a patient in, in, in their, 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 their suture line or something like that. Is, it, it, it has a greenish coloration. It kind of smells like grapes or tortillas. You pretty much know uh, that Pseudomonas aeruginosa is involved in this. Uh, you can find... Pseudomonas aeruginosa very commonly on skin and in water. It's around, right? Uh, so it's one of those bacteria that we're very constantly exposed to, but only in some cases does it cause a problem. Uh, diagnosis for this uh, bacterial culture. You, you got to grab a swab of of the skin, or you know whatever is green in between that person's toes uh, and grow that in culture and look for your gram negative rods for treatment uh, for folliculitis antibiotics. Um, when it comes to uh, swimmer's ear or otitis externa um, eardrops that contain acetic acid or antibacterials, or in some cases, a steroid hormone are used. Uh, the one thing to note is that Pseudomonas aeruginosa comes in with built in resistance to large swaths of our antibiotic spectrum. Uh, basically, uh, there's only a few a few antibiotics that work on them, uh, and also problematically is they very readily form biofilms. So pseudomonas is once you get an infection with it, it can be tricky. Um, if you are someone who's immune compromised, or I'm, I'm sorry, immunocompetent, you're probably in good shape. But people who are immunocompromised, this can be a real issue because uh, their body might not be fighting back against this bacteria uh, like you really want it to be. All right, now for uh, something that we've probably all experienced at some point in our lives or will experience, depending on how old you are, uh, and then there's some of us that are in our 40s where it's still a very real factor, acne. So acne is actually caused by a very specific species of bacteria, Probionibacterium acnes. Uh, this is a gram-positive rod that commonly lives on our skin, but what can happen is it can get into our pores uh, and it caused these inflamed lesions, uh, which includes papules, pustules, nodules, and cysts. And collectively, we describe these, well, pimples uh, as acne. 
Um, it is a normal skin bacteria uh, that resides on almost everybody's bodies, but um, very commonly we see, particularly in young adults, teenagers, um, this manifest as acne. And there are lots of reasons for this, but a lot of it has to do with the fact that during this time in our lives, um, there are hormonal changes, there are growth changes, and as a result, uh, this particular species just seems to have an increased propensity for being able to overgrow, and that results that manifests itself as acne. Uh, diagnosis, there's really no test for this. Uh, we know what it looks like. Um, clinical signs and symptoms are enough. Uh, treatment, um, if it's mild acne, uh, quite often you might get prescribed or use over-the-counter medications containing sal salicylic acid or retinoids. Um, if it's slightly more severe, uh, sometimes you can be prescribed antibiotics. Uh, personally, when I was in high school, uh, I had acne. It wasn't bad. I would say it was probably moderate. And I went on uh, tetracycline for a few years. Um, that went terribly wrong when I went out in the sun one day and had a pretty amazing reaction. Tetracycline can do that to people apparently. Um, but side note, that was just personal. Um, benzoyl peroxide is very commonly used. I'll note this one uh, if you're using this. Be prepared to ruin some sheets and you should put it on at night. And if it comes off the night, you can actually um, remove the color from your clothing. So be careful with that. Um, and some people will actually go on hormone therapy for this. If it's severe, um, isotretinoin and phototherapy uh, are, are often used. But uh, tretinoin has, uh, it, it does a great job, but there's also some pretty severe um, you have to be careful with it. Uh, it does not do well with light. Uh, so sunscreen and stuff like that are going to be implicated there. Uh, complications in severe cases of acne, people can result, can end up with permanent scarring um, because of the damage that it does to the tissue. Um, it's not common, but it does happen. Okay. Uh, now from something acne, which is, you know, something that we're all going to go through and a lot of us go through and largely doesn't have any long-term consequences to something much more severe. So let's talk about anthrax. So anthrax is an infection caused by a gram positive rod called bacillus anthracis. So one thing to note about bacillus anthracis is it can form an endospore. Uh, and that is often how it is being transmitted. So the endospore exists, it gets on your body, often from animal sources or from consuming it as a, poor, a part of infected animal meat, um, you can end up with an infection. Now, anthrax manifests in three different ways, depending on how you acquire it and where it's found in your body. Um, the most common is called cutaneous anthrax, and you end up with this black eschar, which is this massive dead tissue at the site of an infection. Um, you can also get a gastrointestinal form of it that manifests as GI symptoms um, if you ingest it. The one that's really scary kind of is, is inhalation anthrax. And uh, many of you may know that anthrax is one of those uh, bacteria that gets uh, thrown around as a potential type of bioterrorist weapon. The reason why is it can readily form that endospore, which makes it resistant to things like heat and other things. So they can basically take this with the, the hope, the way they would use it is to make sort of a, a, an endospore version of this in like a powder form. And then um, in some cases it's been mailed to people in the form of letters. So they open up the letter and they're exposed. Um, there's also theoretically the possibility that it could be used as a part of like a dirty bomb um, because it would survive the blast. The goal here is to get people to inhale those spores. And once they inhale the spores, they get a very severe um, pulmonary infection, uh, which can, can be fatal. Um, so again, transmission is a result of exposure to these endospores. How do we diagnose it? Well, it depends if it, if it's cutaneous, then we're going to do uh, skin cultures, right? You just culture that eschar and you, you should be able to find the gram positive rod. Um, if it's, uh, if it's a GI based infection, then stool testing. So we'll be looking for the bacteria in the stool. And if you think there's inhalation anthrax, then you're going to need to use CT scans to see where in the body the infection is. Um, you can actually prevent anthrax. There is an anthrax vaccine. However, this is a vaccine that's typically only given to at-risk populations. So these would be people who are working with livestock. So like veterinarians and things like that, um, or people that, uh, or people, uh, who 
uh, are maybe working with anthrax, researching anthrax, um, or potentially people that are in the military uh, because of the potential exposure they may have to some type of weaponized form of anthrax. Treatment for anthrax is broad spectrum antibiotics, but the the major complication is anthrax can be fatal. Um, if it's not treated or if in some cases, even when it is treated, it can be fatal, particularly uh, if it gets into your lungs. So now we're going to turn our attention to bacterial infections of the eyes. So just a reminder of what the structure of the eye looks like. Um, you know, this is, you know, I'm not teaching this as part of an anatomy and physiology class. I'm focusing on the microbiology of it all, but I do like to put this out there so people can understand exactly what we're talking about when we talk about parts of the eyes that are being infected. One of the most common bacterial infections that we're going to find um, uh, is of the eyes that we're going to find is bacterial conjunctivitis. Um, so there are uh, lots of like you, any bacteria that gets in the eye can be problematic, but I'm going to focus mainly on the four most predominant causative agents that we find in bacterial conjunctivitis cases. Uh, the most common is actually a gram negative rod called Haemophilus influenzae. Um, but there are a couple other bacterial species that we find too. Uh, Morixella cateralis, which is a gram-negative diplococcus, Streptococcus pneumoniae, which is a gram-positive diplococcus, and then here it comes again, Staphylococcus aureus, a gram-positive Staphylococcus. Signs and symptoms, we know what pink eye looks like, right? Uh, inflammation of the conjunctiva, uh, discharge of sticky fluid, itchy. You, you wake up with that feeling that your eyes glued together um, because of, uh, of the secretions and all that stuff. It's not good, but it's usually pretty obvious when somebody has conjunctivitis. Um, it is incredibly contagious. So if you come down with bacterial conjunctivitis, please don't go near people. Uh, you are going to give it to them. Uh, it's very contagious. Uh, you can spread it through contact with secretions from an infected person. Um, diagnosis, clinical signs and symptoms. You go to the doctor and you have that going on. They're like, yeah, you, you've got pink eye. You've got conjunctivitis. Um, but they may take bacterial cultures to figure out exactly what species it is. Quite often, a bacterial conjunctivitis will resolve on its own. They may prescribe you antibiotic eye drops uh, to help you get rid of that. Um, it can progress into a more serious condition uh, in some cases. Um, if it's not treated properly, promptly, uh, or if uh, sort of an infection that doesn't start to resolve on its own doesn't end up getting treated. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, neonatal conjunctivitis is a little different. This is going to be the result of some type of bacterium being uh, can, uh, being introduced into the eyes during the birthing process. Uh, the two most common we see here are Neisseria gonorrhea and Chlamydia trachomatis. So Neisseria gonorrhea, gonorrhea, Chlamydia trachomatis, Chlamydia. This is going to be the result of the mother uh, having an, an STD. Um, and maybe not knowing it. Uh, and we'll learn in, in, in a couple other, in a few videos uh, down the road where we talk about um, diseases of the urinary tract um, and, and the reproductive tract that um, a lot of people that have chlamydia and gonorrhea are asymptomatic. They don't know that they have it. Um, so this can be spread that way. Um, description of the causative agents, Neisseria, all Neisseria are gram-negative diplococci, uh, and then chlamydia trichomatis. Chlamydia is a gram-negative intracellular bacterium. It lives inside of our cells, uh, kind of like a virus. It's not a virus, but kind of like one. So signs and symptoms, exactly what you'd expect. Uh, inflammation of the conjunctiva, discharge of sticky fluid, itchy. Um, again, like I said, this is transmitted vertically through uh, from an infected mother. Um, and it will be diagnosed by clinical signs and symptoms, but they may culture the species to get an ID, right? Because if the baby has this, then you know the mom has an STD and it's probably a good idea to figure out what that is so you can treat that as well. Um, one of the ways we prevent this, and this is pretty standard, is one of the first things that's going to happen after a baby is born, mom gets to hold it for like 30 seconds, dad maybe gets to look at it as it goes by, um, and it ends up getting antibiotic eye drops like immediately uh, to fight off that infection. So if there are, if there are bacteria present, those antibiotics should kill it right away. Uh, treatment, oral or IV antibiotics are used. Um, the complications here is, remember, this is a developing person. Uh, so if, if the infection is severe enough, vision loss or permanent blindness are potential complications from neonatal conjunctivitis, which is why in, in many states, it's just standard for babies born, baby gets antibiotic eye drops. 
So the, the deeper infection that I was talking about before is called keratitis. So bacterial keratitis, uh, the two most common causative agents are staphylococcus epidermidis, which as, as you recall, is one of those normal skin bacteria that we have. Like I said, if it gets in the wrong place, it can be problematic. Same with Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Um, uh, descriptions are right there. You, you've met these guys before. Signs and symptoms are going to be redness, pain, and discharge from the eye, which sounds which is a lot like conjunctivitis, but notice the pain right? This hurts. This isn't itchy. It isn't bothersome. It hurts. And that's because it's going to be deeper in the eye. You're also going to notice blurred or reduced vision. You may experience photophobia because it's going to hurt to look at light. The most common way you're going to get this is through contact lens use. That contact lens sits on your eye and just stays there all day long and maybe longer depending on uh, which type of lenses you have. And if you touch them with your, with your, with your fingers or uh, like that, some of that skin bacteria, Staphylococcus epidermidis, Pseudomonas aeruginosa can then make it into your eye. Diagnosis, again, clinical symptoms and uh, a bacterial culture to ID the species. So we know what we're treating. Please make sure you take care of your contact lenses. All right. Um, you know, it, it really matters. These things go in your eyes and there's a very real potential uh, for vision loss or permanent blindness as a result of an infection like this. Um, and don't wear them overnight. It's not good practice. Uh, treatment, antibiotics. That's how we're going to fix this. Okay, so now we're going to turn our attention to viral infections of the skin and eyes. So everything before we talked about, everything we talked about, all are going to be bacterial species. And that's why you've got like cool descriptions. They're gram-negative rods, gram-positive staphylococci. Um, but now we're going to talk about viral infections. So one of the most common viral skin infections around are caused by the human papilloma, ha, human papilloma virus, so HPV. Now there's like 60 different strains of this, so there's a lot of them around. Um, signs and symptoms of these are going to be warts. Uh, that's that's how HPV manifests. Now I know there are some other strains of HPV. There are other strains of HPV that are implicated in uh, like cervical cancer. Um, those weirdly don't usually cause warts, but pretty much every other strain of HPV does. You get these by contacting someone that has a wart. Um, warts spread to cause other warts and they are diagnosed clinically. There's not much to look at. And yes, there are different kinds of warts, uh, you know, like plantar warts, things like that. Um, can you prevent this? Kind of. Uh, there is an HPV vaccine out there, but the HPV vaccine typically focuses on the strains that can cause cancer. The ones that you're seeing here in these pictures are not ones that cause cancer. So this works on a handful of strains, but I don't think it, th there's not a good evidence that it's going to prevent you from getting warts. Treatment, well, there's lots of different ways to treat warts. Salicylic acid is a common one. You can freeze them off. You can burn them off. You can cut them off. Um, you can excise them. You can put canth cantharidin on them. There are chemical peels. There's lots of different ways to treat warts. Um, there are OTC ones where you treat them just over the counter, and sometimes you need to go see a dermatologist and have them removed. There really are no complications associated with warts. They're just off-putting. Uh, nobody wants to have them. All right, now let's move on to oral herpes, also known as cold sores. So there are two types of herpes simplex virus that cause these HSV-1 and HSV-2. Those are the two, uh, the two strains. Um, signs and symptoms, cold sores, red lesions on the, on the lips or near the mouth, uh, and they blister, burst, and crust over. These are very easily transmitted via skin to skin contact. So if somebody has a cold sore, don't kiss them, uh, you know, don't touch them because there's a very real possibility that they could spread it to you. Diagnosis, clinical signs and symptoms, uh, very easily recognizable. And here the treatment uh, uh, depends. Um, there are antiviral therapies that can be used to prevent the symptoms and prevent the spread. So these are going to be the same uh, types of antivirals that are used in people who have um, genital herpes uh, because it's the same viruses. It's HSV1, HSV2. So people that take those particular antivirals may have a reduced recurrence of cold sores, reduced uh, reduced uh, reduced number of outbreaks. Okay, but it doesn't 
mean the disease is gone. It doesn't mean the virus is gone from your body. And there's still a very real possibility that you could spread it to others. So the complications, herpes viruses remain latent. You get it once, and then it hides and it comes back from time to time. Uh, it's also possible for lesions to spread to other parts of the body. So oral herpes can turn into genital herpes if contact between those regions occurs. And I'm just going to leave it at that. Um, and the other thing is the latent infection can actually reinfect the eye. Um, the herpes virus tends to live in, in the trigeminal nerve, which innervates both this part of our face, the lips and the mouth, but also the eyes. And if it gets into the ocular branch of the trigeminal nerve, there is a potential um, for a, a viral infection of the eye, which can be quite serious. Another viral infection uh, of the skin is roseola. Um, this is caused by the human herpes virus 6, HH, HHV6, and in some cases, HHV7. Uh, the signs and symptoms, uh, runny nose to start. Then there'll be a sore throat and a cough and a very high fever. So this is often comes across as one of those like nondescript, my young child has a virus. Super high fever, runny nose, sore throat. People are just going to label it as like, meh. Then you get this rash, usually three to five days after the fever breaks. So like the fever breaks and you think things are going well, then all of a sudden you see the rash and that's going to be the dead giveaway uh, for, for roseola. Um, transmission, direct contact with saliva or respiratory droplets. And again, like almost everyone is exposed to this at some point in your life. You were probably exposed to it as a young child. This is not something that's going to cause really any serious complications in immune competent individuals. If somebody uh, is, is immunocompromised, they may prescribe antivirals to help fight this off. Uh, but again, not really a severe infection. The fever can be scary, right? Nobody likes it when they're, when they're two or three year old has like 103 or 104 degree fever. That's scary, right? Um, but outside of that, really not complicated. And generally you're only going to get this once in your life. You're going to end up with immunity as a result, but there's no vaccine for this. This is something that we've just kind of been like, yeah, you're probably going to get it and your kid's going to be fine. And then they're going to be immune for it the rest of their life. Fifth disease. All right. Now I want to stress this. It is not fifth's disease. It's not named after a guy named Jerry fifth. Uh, the story of the name of fifth disease, uh, is essentially back in the latter half of the 19th century, medicine was like becoming a science. And I know that sounds weird because we think of medicine always being a science, but there was a lot of wacky stuff that happened in medical history that I don't think we can call science. Uh, but they were starting to sort of categorize diseases and come up with guides to help diagnose these things. And at the time, there were a number of different childhood rash diseases and this was this this was the fifth one <laughs> so it just got the name fifth disease uh so that's what it goes by so it's not named after a person it's just fifth disease uh the causative agents are parvovirus b19 uh, i know we think of parvo as being predominantly a dog virus and there are um dog viruses from this particular group of viruses, but parvo and virus B19 is a virus that infects humans. Uh, the thing you'll notice with the unique signs and symptoms, so headache, fever, upset stomach, that's not that common. But what you're going to notice is a rash that covers the entire body, but there's going to be this very pronounced reddening of the cheeks. And this gets known as the slapped cheek rash. And this is the dead giveaway. This is the, there really are no other um, uh, rash the infections that cause a rash like this, that are going to have that slap cheek appearance. Um, transmission, again, direct contact with saliva or respiratory droplets. And this is like a recurring theme, right? These are skin-based diseases and you get them by inhaling something. Um, they just manifest as rashes. Uh, diagnosis, clinical signs and symptoms. Treatment, symptomatic. This is not something that's going to cause any major issues in someone who is immunocompetent. People who are immunocompromised, though, uh, may have to go on some type of treatment uh, using immunoglobulin therapy or blood transfusions uh, to help their body rid itself of the infection. Um, in complications, in most cases, adults don't get the rash, 
but they can get joint pain and swelling that lasts for months. So you may have heard this about chicken pox. So, okay, I'm going to show my age here. When I was a kid, there was no chicken pox vaccine. And everybody just got chicken pox, which we'll talk about later on when it comes to shingles is problematic. But the thought process behind exposing kids, like people would intentionally expose their children to chicken pox. If you found out that if your parents found out that like your friend, like Joey down the street has chicken pox, they might send you to go hang out with Joey. <laughs> They're like, oh, Joey, I just stay home from school. He's not feeling well. Why don't you go play with Joey and cheer him up? They were hoping to get you exposed to chicken pox because it's better to get it at a younger age. The illness is much harder for your body to get rid of as you get older. And we kind of see this thing with fifth disease where Adults aren't going to get the rash, but the joint pain and the swelling lasts for months. Uh, so it's one of those things where it's like much more problematic to get as an adult. You almost want to be exposed as a child because chances are it's not going to be nearly as problematic for you, uh, which I, I just think is kind of interesting, right? Like it's interesting that like certain diseases are like almost better for you to get as a kid than as an adult because your body handles it better. Uh, viruses can also impact the eyes. Um, so the most common cause of viral conjunctivitis is a group of viruses known as adenoviruses. These are the most common. Now you're going to get the sign, same, almost the exact same signs and symptoms as bacterial conjunctivitis. But the thing that's going to help is bacterial conjunctivitis is going to cause this sort of milky white exudate, this sort of like, ugh, like crusty, pussy mess coming out of your eyes. Whereas the discharge from viral conjunctivitis is watery. It's, you have like this runny eye syndrome. It looks like you have allergies and there is something called allergic conjunctivitis, which appears the same way. This is actually helpful uh, because chances are if you have viral conjunctivitis, you got this as the result of having a cold. Usually you get some type of virus that we would just label as a cold. All right. And then you end up with this viral conjunctivitis on the back end. Why is this helpful? Well, viral conjunctivitis, at least this type of viral conjunctivitis, doesn't require any treatment. It's not going to work, but there's also no complications. Usually your body just, once it rids itself entirely of the cold virus or whatever it was that you had, the viral conjunctivitis will clear up with it. This is going to be more of like an additional symptom or an additional sign of, of some other viral infection that you have, as opposed to being a standalone thing, which is what bacterial conjunctivitis is. Now, as I mentioned in a previous uh, in a previous slide, uh, HSV one can actually manifest as a viral infection of the eye. So this is what's called herpes keratitis. This is what's going to happen if that herpes virus comes out of latency and then reactivates in the ocular branch of the trigeminal nerve versus the mandibular branch. So the mandibular branch is going to give you cold sores. This is essentially, and it doesn't look like that, but you, you basically have a cold sore growing in your eye. Um, and you're going to notice the signs and symptoms of keratitis, uh, redness, pain. This is going to hurt. You'll have discharge from the eye, blurred or reduced vision, photophobia. So you're seeing all the signs of bacterial keratitis. Uh, this is much more problematic though. Um, and there's going to need to be laboratory testing to confirm that it is in fact HSV one that's causing this. And they're going to treat with antivirals. If this particular infection isn't brought under control fairly quickly, there is the very real possibility that people could suffer permanent vision loss or in worst case scenarios, permanent blindness, uh, as a result of this particular infection. Okay, now let's talk about fungal infections of the skin. So we've talked about our bacterial infections. We've talked about our viral infections. What can fungi do uh, to impact our bodies? Well, uh, the first thing we'll talk about are the tinnias. Um, so these are largely superficial skin-based fungal infections caused by uh, a group of bac a group of fungi called dermatophytes. Uh, so trichophyton, epidermophyton, and microsporum are the three major genera of fungi that cause these things. Um, and just broadly in terms of how they're described, they're just fungi. All right. Um, now, what we refer, the reason why we refer to these as tinnias is this is how the individual like infections are labeled. So for example, tinea corporis, 
ringworm. We're all very familiar with ringworm, right? You can see that uh, show up down here. Uh, Tinea capitis is another form of ringworm that occurs in the scalp. Tinea pedis, also known as athlete's foot. Tinea barbe in the beard. Uh, that's barber's itch. Tinea cruris, jock itch, which impacts the groin. Tinea unguium, which are also known as onchomycosis. This is what infects um, the toenails and fingernails. You've probably seen the talking toenail uh, on, on commercials on TV. Um, you get this by being exposed to the fungal spores, um, which usually is going to come from another human or an animal. Now, what's interesting about these is one of the easiest ways to diagnose them is using ultraviolet light, also known as a woods lamp. These things will light up. You turn out the light, you hit them with that UV light, and they will glow like fluorescently under that black light. Um, which makes it really easy. Just like, yep, that's what that is. Um, when you see stuff like this, we don't really have to worry about it. But remember, you can get this from your pets. So for example, if your dog has that, it's kind of hard to see the ringworm because it's under all of his fur. But if you use an ultraviolet light, that section of their fur will actually glow under the ultraviolet light. And like, yeah, your dog has ringworm. <laughs> and then you and your old family are now potentially at risk for this. Treatment, antifungals, usually creams. Uh, you just put this on top. And a lot of these things are available over the counter uh, at this point. So things like uh, like Lotrimin and Tenactin and, and things like that contain these. But there are also prescription-based ones for more serious cases. Um, the next up is cutaneous aspergillosis. So uh, aspergillus is black mold. Um, we see it growing in our environment. Uh, the two major species of aspergillus that are going to cause aspergill cutaneous aspergillosis are aspergillus flavus and aspergillus fumigatus. Um, these are uh, the signs and symptoms are you're going to see these black ascars. So this is the same type of thing that you're going to see as a result of cutaneous anthrax. Uh, and you're going to see these at the site of the infection. So usually you're going to get this. If you're going to get this kind of in the wild, it's usually a result of exposure of fungi to a wound site. And this is typically going to occur either in agricultural or outdoor environments. So if you work on a farm, you work with livestock, uh, you know, you, you're an avid hiker or fisher or something like that, you're at greater risk of developing this than the average person. You're still not at any major great risk, but still possible. It's also possible for opportunistic infections to, to be acquired in a healthcare setting. So this would be a, a type of nosocomial infection or a healthcare associated infection, depending on which terminology you prefer. Uh, this will be diagnosed through clinical signs and symptoms. Quite often, they'll take a fungal culture uh, and do some microscopy. And, and as soon as they see this little guy here at the bottom under the microscope, they'll know what we're dealing with. Uh, typically, you're going to use antifungals to treat this. Um, but surgical and immunotherapy treatments are available, particularly in patients who are either immunocompromised or are burn patients uh, because they're, remember, you, you, you lose those, if you're burned, you lose that outer protective layer and your body's going to have a harder time. So they might use uh, some other interventions to just sort of remove that whole tissue so it can't spread elsewhere in the body. Uh, you can also, another type of fungi you can get is candida, uh, candida albicans. Um, candida albicans uh, can cause, um, Several types of infections uh, in in the mouth. It can cause thrush. Um, in the general area, particularly in women, it can cause yeast infections. But it can also cause infections of the skin and nails, uh, which you're seeing here. Uh, so you can get rashes within your skin folds. Uh, you can get yellow, hardened nails as a result of this. You can see that down here. Uh, here's some of that. Uh, how do you get this? Well, like 99% of us have candida species in or on our bodies, like at all times. So this is typically going to be the result of an opportunistic infection. This is candida uh, either ending up somewhere where it's not supposed to be or kind of catching you on an off day, right? If, if something's going on, some other type of infections happening, it lowers your, it, it, it lowers your immune status and all of a sudden it, it can find itself in a place and take over. Uh, diagnosis, clinical signs and symptoms. Uh, usually they can tell by looking at it and then do some microscopy on some tissue samples. The treatment will be antifungals. Uh, the one thing that we really worry about here is if you're immunocompromised, uh, let's say you're uh, like somebody that has AIDS or maybe you're on cancer treatment uh, or have some other type of um, illness that impacts your immune system, 
Canada can get into your body. And while these are very um, superficial, fairly treatable, not likely to cause any type of long-term serious damage, once Canada makes it into your body, um, it's really hard to get rid of. And because the people who are typically getting it in their body are immune, are immune compromised to begin with, highly problematic. We don't like that. That That's potentially fatal. Okay, in the last few slides, we'll talk about a couple of protozoan and helminthic infections of the skin and eyes. So reminder, protozoans are your single-celled eukaryotes. Helminths are going to be your worms and flukes and things like that. So uh, the first one we'll talk about is amoebic keratitis, also known as a canthamoeba keratitis. It's caused by um, it's caused by a canthamoeba, um, which is a protozoan. It's an amoeba. It's, it's right in the name. Uh, signs and symptoms: redness, pain, discharge from the eye, blurred or reduced vision, or photophobia. Right? We're talking about keratitis. This is an infection uh, deep within the eye. Again, you can often get this through contact lens use. The thing you have to realize is a canthamoeba are everywhere. Uh, they're even in they're in your swimming pool, they're in your hot tub, they're even in your tap water, and they normally don't bother anybody. But you need to be very careful about how you use your contact lenses. You cannot wash them in water. You need to use the sterile solution they give you because if you end up with a canthamoeba on your contact lens and then mash it up against your eye all day or for even longer if you leave it in while you sleep or for multiple days, these will start to burrow into your eye and start literally destroying it. Um, so treatment, topical antiseptics. I mean, we're talking like serious, painful, not fun treatments. Um, I had, uh, there was one patient that described the treatment, um, waking up every morning and putting the, the analogy was basically like putting hot, like putting acid in your eye in the morning and then doing it again before you go to bed. And you do that for a few months. Uh, and hope that it gets rid of the amoebas. Uh, if it doesn't, you may, once the infection is gone and there's permanent damage, you may need a corneal transplant. Um, complications, vision loss, permanent blindness. It is very difficult to treat and um, your eyes very close to your brain. And in some cases, it disseminates into the nervous system, causes amoebic encephalitis, and that's fatal. That's done. Um, and then we also have acanthamoeba skin infections. Same same group of, of protozoans, uh, but this manifests as abscesses, ulcers, or nodules on the skin. Typically, they're going to get in through the wound. In some cases, they actually get in through the GI tract. You'll need to do microscopy to look for those amoebas, uh, and then topical antiseptics are going to be used to kill these guys off. And again, if it gets access to the nervous system, the patient's in real trouble. Uh, and then the last one is the Loa Loa African eye worm. Uh, so Loa Loa is the species, genus Loa, species Loa. Um, this is a helminth. It is a worm. You can see it down here and you can actually see it um, as gruesome and horrifying as it is. That's how you deserve it, right? Uh, That's how you observe it, right? You look into the patient's eyes and you will see the worms moving under their skin or in the conjunctiva of their eye. Horrifying. Horrifying. I didn't know how to say it, right? Uh, you will have eye pain and itching. You may get allergic inflammation, which are known as calabar swellings uh, and joint and muscle pain, depending on where in your body uh, it is. So the lysis, um is both an eye infection and or a skin infection, depending on where they are. Uh, treatment, sorry, treatment is anti-helminthics. And then if you have a prolonged infection, you can end up with permanent damage to whichever uh, tissues are impacted. So uh, that's it for this particular uh, this particular uh, slideshow. So we've gone through uh, a bunch of different infections of the skin and eyes. Uh, please note that they've been broken down based on which group of microbe we're talking about. Um, so take a look at these and uh, yeah, give me some feedback in the comments if you need anything. Thanks.